afternoon in Switzerland. It's Space Cafe Balkan time. Our next edition of Space Cafe Balkan, in association, with, in association with the Serbian Case for Space, will begin soon. As always, we really appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. We will learn and improve based on your feedback. My name is Kara Monter. I am the events coordinator at Spacewatch Global and host of the Space Cafe Benelux, together with my co-host Banu Barzingi. Spacewatch is a Switzerland-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. Today, we are joined with Marko Bajovic uh, of the Serbian Case for Space. In him, we have found a great friend and a wonderful host for our outreach in the Balkan region. I know many of you are already very familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters, and the Space Cafe podcasts. Our latest episode went online yesterday. It's definitely worth a listen, especially if you want to build your own house on Mars. We would also like to inform you that we are keeping our fan shop online open to you to support us actively and become a space watcher. Edition One has cool items for you, your friends, and the ones you love. Your support is needed to keep our work alive for you. If you've missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive on our web page in the events section and on YouTube. We will host our Space Cafe Balkan Live regularly. And with that, my job is done, and I would love to hand over to our host, Marco for today. Over to you, Marco. Thank you, Kara. So good day to everyone or evening, depending on where you're based. Uh, thank you for joining us for the very first Space Cafe Balkan. Uh, first, I would like to uh, give a big thanks to Spacewatch Global. Their support has been invaluable for all kinds of projects that we have begun and as well for, for, for this one. Uh, before uh, we begin, I would uh, like to dedicate a few words to our organization, Serbian Case for Space Foundation. So it was founded in 2017 with the goal of popularizing space science and technology through writing articles, attending space conferences, lobbying in governmental organizations, and uh, organizing uh, workshops and webinars. This web talk is one such event. We envisioned it as a casual talk or discussion on the potential of space uh, in the Balkan region, having in mind how different countries are in uh, different stages of development, but on the other hand, as they are all part of one region, both historically and geographically, they have a lot of things in common. Let's call it that Balkan flavor. Uh, as a moderator today, uh, moderator today, I will uh, ask our guests some questions at first, and then we can uh, we'll have a dedicated session that for for you as well. Uh, to answer uh, this, we we like to call it a burning question: uh, Could Balkan become an emerging space region? Today with us is Raicho Raicho, founder and CEO of Endurasat. Raicho is a su successful space interpreter, but also a scientist with an impressive resume uh, featuring work in national space programs and international, or international space organizations. Raicho is the first Bulgarian to have completed the Singularity University Technology Program hosted by NASA's Ames Research Center. He also worked with the Brazilian Space Program and the Space Research Technology Institute in Bulgaria. Prior to founding Endurosat, Raicho created the leading educational program for space science, technology, and exploration space challenges. Uh, Endurosat uh, is uh, one of the uh, fastest growing space companies in Europe. Uh, Endurosat design, build, and operate uh, CubeSats for scientific and commercial purposes. So to kick off this conversation, uh, I would like to ask Raicho uh, like an uh, introduction, uh, introductionary question. So as uh, we, we, you have done a recently, uh, actually Forbes has done a recently a very good article regarding you and Endurosat. And, uh, but uh, doing space activities in the Balkans uh, is mostly met with high dose of skepticism. So uh, my question is, uh, 
how did it all start for Endurasat? And uh, what made you decide to simply make this space company in our tumultuous region? Yeah, so thanks for the invitation uh, and really honored to, to take part in this conversation. Uh, what's, what's, uh, what was the reason for me starting in Durusat? Uh, in a, in a simple words, it was my dream since I was a kid to build spacecraft and uh, somehow this dream didn't die when I was growing uh, older. And uh, th this is what uh, made me uh, uh, move towards the space sector in general. Uh, in the Balkans, it's a, it's a really uh, amazing environment from one side, uh, very vibrant, uh, uh, filled with incredible engineers. From the other side, it's uh, also the Balkans filled with negativity and uh, really skepticism all around. Uh, so when I started the idea about Endurosat, uh, first I started, by the way, uh, with, with a small educational program uh, that we run successfully with Sofia University. Uh, it was 2010. And, uh, and when we started this educational program to formally introduce space environment to already accomplished young engineers and scientists from our region, uh, you can imagine <laughs> the, the avalanche of uh, negativity and uh, skepticism that, that we got. Uh, but every year, uh, this program accumulated quite a big interest to, to, towards exactly where we wanted it. The young people of the region, uh, very sm actually tremendously smarter than myself people, already being accomplished engineers and scientists that just didn't know how to adapt their already fundamental knowledge and engineering skills into the space environment. So we thought, well, if we invite leading experts from around the planet to come and, and, and show us the way a little bit, maybe they can apply their, their know-how into, the young people could, could apply their know-how into, into this. And this is how the program started in 2010. By 2015, this was uh, probably one of the largest uh, self-organized <laughs> educational programs in the region, uh, which I was really uh, proud of because I saw uh, hundreds of young uh, people uh, having access to direct access to, to many of the world leading experts, to, uh, not being afraid to ask questions about space because space sector in general is always perceived even today by very smart people in different industries. Uh, as a as a beyond their reach type of uh, segment, so something that is uh, you know space is there and I'm here and uh, there is no way for me to apply any skills or connectivity directly connecting my work and, and my life to, to the space sector, and and the whole concept behind space challenges was to make space closer to everyone in the region and beyond. In 2000 by 2015 we were running this educational program for already five years, and uh, in the duration of running this program. Uh, with South University, I've met the, the first uh, uh, young people that uh, at the time, by the way, when I talk young people, they were on my age, so more or less the same age, uh, because I was young once as well. And then, and, then, uh, and, and then we sat together one day and said, well, you know, uh, we, are, we are here, five of us, uh, each of us in di with different skills, uh, skill sets in technology, uh, especially in, in engineering, but also a little bit in business. Uh, I think it's now time for us to move to the next stage and, and always the dream has been to make space more accessible, to, to make space more closer to the people on the ground. So what better stage for us to prove our, <laughs> to validate our assumptions and dreams to, uh, through creating our own initiative. And this is how Endurosat got born in 2015. Uh, and this is, uh, this is more or less the initial part of the journey. Uh, we started in a 25 square meter attic apartment in Sofia, telling everyone enthusiastically, well, you know, we're going to build uh, our own uh, type of uh, spacecraft. At the time, we already knew that the nanostrite as a technology existed. We were very enthusiastic about it, and we saw several areas where we could absolutely improve it uh, and get it to the next level. And uh, this is how we started. And of course, <laughs> when we started talking to investors in our region, at the beginning, you can imagine me going uh, inside someone's uh, successful business office and, and, and telling, hey, I'm right and I'm going to literally uh, change and, and improve the, the way that people operate in space. And uh, uh, from 40 conversations, 39 ended in disasters. Uh, uh, anywhere from a very soft no to hell no to one guy actually called the security guards to walk me out of the building. <laughs> so this was at the beginning. Uh, but we were really fortunate at the end, you know, li life always meets you with the proper people at the proper time. 
so our first investors actually I'm really proud of it, uh, proud of it are uh, angel investors that were already successfully making successful software companies in our region and, and they knew how hard it is to start something from scratch in, in, the, in the region and especially in Bulgaria and uh, from there on we just kept building, kept dreaming and kept, uh, kept our spirit uh, alive and I'm extremely fortunate to work with people that are tremendously more uh, smarter and more agile than myself in the, in the team. We keep growing, but at the same time, uh, it, it, it is today incredible for me when, when, I, uh, when I talk to, to our engineers in the lab and, and I remember six years ago, the attic apartment and the skepticism. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's a completely different uh, ballpark and, uh, and hopefully it continues to grow this way. And hopefully we inspire better people than us to, to build even more grander visions of the future, including space. So Enduro Sad has come a long way since then, since the small apartment and uh, the people calling security. You're, <laughs> it is already recognized a lot in space community, uh, obviously in our region, but uh, globally as well. Uh, so uh, yeah, I would just like to say that uh, Matt Tom has uh, understood our, uh, let's call it a casual discussion on space. And he has uh, already asked a question that I wanted to ask. <laughs> so uh, my, my question was regarding the uh, opening of the uh, manufacturing in Italy and what were the biggest uh, obstacles on the path that you had to overcome. But I will also continue with the math questions. He asked, uh, first of all, he saying hi and saying that he's following Endurosat for the last couple of years. And uh, given the success of Endurosat, uh, what are your biggest barriers, barriers to growth in terms of obtaining funds uh, and scaling teams? So let's, let's yes. fuse the, the two questions. Okay, so, so first, uh, it, uh, what we did, and we're really pr proud of it, we opened uh, a, a business and development office in Italy. Uh, the reason is that uh, we have uh, seen that uh, uh, in, in other parts of Europe, there is also a need uh, uh, of easier access to space. And there are a huge amount of extremely interesting organizations that are striving to get to the final frontier, but didn't have uh, necessarily the means to do so uh, in, a, in a more practical and cost-effective way. So we said uh, we, we saw an opportunity and we expanded few months ago in terms of manufacturing and design and engineering our entire team is uh, currently in, in located in Sofia and uh, we are we are full stack satellite manufacturer and design builder at the end and uh, in our core as a company and Durosat is an R&D studio and this is what makes me extremely proud because we enjoy building new technologies iterating those technologies and, and hopefully push our own knowledge and, and, and push our products towards the uh, the maximum level of performance. In terms of uh, scalability problems, uh, where should I start from? I mean, uh, I believe every, every initiative and everything that, that each of us does in, in his own life uh, inevitably would face challenges. And, and the bigger you grow, the bigger the challenges and, and different the challenges are. Uh, from, from the other side, uh, uh, the growth so far has been uh, quite fast, even during the, uh, the sad COVID uh, times that we live, we scaled three times our team and now we are almost, uh, I think, 80 people on board uh, or 81, I'm not sure anymore, but the, the idea is that uh, scaling brings huge amount of challenges. Uh, for once, um, I personally don't like administration and processes. I don't believe that you can get uh, uh, R&D and creativity in the same room with a huge amount of processes. So we try to keep it as much as possible lean. On the other side, you cannot also have free for all in an organization that tries to build quite uh, complex systems and tries to validate and make sure the system doesn't fail because everything in space sadly in majority of cases leads to some kind of a failure or a problem in orbit and we don't uh, want to do to have uh, that and of course hoping that we have least amount of those and uh, i think scaling first challenge is your own mindset uh, and the way that you approach your business second challenge is that uh, you know and is six years old I, I feel 600 years old i mean it's uh, 
<laughs> inevitably when you grow the organization, uh, uh, the more and more it grows, the more and more you adapt to the fact that uh, uh, as, a, as a leader, you only receive the, the challenges, the, the bad news in the room always because you have to always, uh, fix it or, or, or try to fix it, listening to, to, the, to the smarter people in the room. And, uh, and this tires you sometimes, but then you walk next door and you see the, the guys actually building it and, uh, and seeing this technology and, and knowing that a few years ago, this was just a conceptual idea and, and now you can touch it and you can see how it works and you can get uh, telemetry and see how it actually functions in its environment. And, and, and this is like, uh, uh, an incredible incentivizer and keeps you it keeps you awake. So, in a, in a nutshell, I think the barrier, the major barriers are first your own personal mental barrier. From the other side, of course, it's very specific to our region. I can only share my own experience and my own opinion about it because I haven't scaled uh, companies and teams in different regions of the planet. But in Bulgaria, at the beginning, it was very difficult because uh, you can imagine trying to recruit uh, properly good engineers and telling them come to the attic apartment and I share you the grandiose vision of the future. Oh, and by the way, we don't have, uh, we are bootstrapped. Uh, this is the other thing that the, at the beginning, we started the company with such a small investment that, uh, that we had hard time afterwards when we talk to, to bigger investment groups the, uh, to convince them that we have, uh, we have scaled organically up to that point because organically they were connecting space with companies that uh, issued invest 10 or 100 or or more than 100 million just to take off the ground. And maybe in a few, many years ahead of you, you can get any type of return on investment. While we are sustainable business and growing as we are, we, we keep also sustainability in the process. Uh, and, and this was very hard at the beginning, very hard to convince investors, very hard to attract talents. Now we have different challenges. When you scale up, you, you try to retain the, the freedom of everyone on board. We try to limit the administration, but you, you need administration to, to make sure that the process, at least minimal amount of process are in place so that you can scale properly also technology and maintain what is most valuable to us, which is the quality of our products and the quality of our services. Uh, so there is an array of difficulties scaling up. And I think uh, uh, each difficulty makes you a little bit more, uh, more enthusiastic and more depressed at the same time. And you just have to find the balance between depression and enthusiasm all the time. <laughs> Good. Well, and also when when you mentioned the administration, and uh, I think that can also and also bureaucracy. I think that can also funnel into that depression a bit, you know, <laughs> because as you grow bigger, you you'll you'll also deal with a lot of administration as a as a leader of a, such a. A huge group so that will that will be a challenge as well and also for you as a scientist who i guess uh, <laughs> would like to tinker with all the little scientific details then dabble in 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 administration but that's that's how it goes uh, so also um, my, my uh, question since you mentioned the the manufacturing in italy so uh, can you no no just just to repeat we are not manufacturing anything yeah. in Italy we have that business development office business development. We are manufacturing okay. a bu building and, and so on. yeah yeah business development yeah so uh, can you tell me something about the the differences I mean for example why did you did you choose Italy for that part and uh, how can we maybe uh, transfer that back to to our region. Uh, Italy is one of the leading European countries in terms of uh, uh, space flight heritage, human space flight, uh, incredible treasure trove of engineers. Um, so uh, in, our in our company, we have a lot of people from around the planet, including Italy, one of the co-founders as well is Italian. So we had a lot of connections so way before we, we, we decided, okay, let's, let's really go and expand there. And, and I think... Uh, uh, if I have to be honest, from our current experiences uh, so far, uh, Italy has been much more administration heavy than what uh, has we've seen in Bulgaria, which makes me enthusiastic. Uh, from the other side, of course, uh, in Italy, space sector exists uh, a lot of uh, a lot of regulations and a lot of 
um, a lot of professions are already connected with the space industry. While in, in Sofia, for a long, long time, we have been quite uh, unique. And, and from our side, it's always, uh, it helps you because you're different. From the other side, you're different. So it doesn't necessarily uh, brings you enormous amount of popularity. And, and people are, are very skeptical in our region, as I mentioned. When we started, uh, you can imagine many, many interesting engineers at the beginning turned down offers joining company our company because they they simply deemed it completely crazy idea. Uh, and and moreover, when when you are sharing this idea in a small rooms, <laughs> uh, they they were uh, getting less and less enthusiastic. I can see their in their eyes at the beginning. Uh, so in Italy, it's much, more, much more easier at the beginning uh, with the established space sector, with the with the growing space industry, with quite a few interesting startups there as well, with with whom we find uh, quite a few in, in, interesting synergies to work with early on. Uh, this was what inclined us to to move to there, and and I'm really enthusiastic to see in the, in the coming few months uh, uh, how we will develop partnerships there and. and uh, and, and even see few missions uh, taking off the ground, ideally. And uh, since you mentioned the, the uh, also the, let's call it the administration obstacles in Italy. And uh, so I guess that the governmental uh, agencies there are obviously helping the, the, the space development, but maybe there are also some obstacles regarding that. Can you also do a bit of a, uh, comparison, how can the uh, governments help completely in, in the private sector? I mean, obviously there is a lot of negative associations with government in private sector because they mostly don't help. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but since this uh, since space is a bit still uh, kind of linked to the, the governments, and uh, so what is their role in this whole thing? Also, both in, the, uh, in say, Bulgaria, with, with your experience, but also in, in Italy? Uh, again, I don't have a lot of ex expertise in the Italian uh, administration myself, because there were other people from our team being responsible for the registrations and licensing. Uh, from one side, when you have established uh, administration that is, has always been working well for many, many years, from one side, it's good because you have everything settled and it's more or less evident uh, what you need to do. From the other side, it's also uh, sometimes a major drawback because uh, technology has developed so fast. Uh, space sector has been experienced incredible amount of innovation in all, all areas from rocket engines, uh, rocket science to, to satellites, to data services. And, and if your administration and regulation apparatus stays at a very traditional norm, norms, it really kills off innovation. And that's the biggest difficulty, in my opinion, for majority of the uh, European countries. From the other side, uh, of course, we are fortunate enough to live in the European Union. So majority of regulations are absolutely followed. And, uh, and as, as far as I know, in all the countries are uh, are same or uh, very similar. Uh, and, and this gives the Balkans uh, an incredible opportunity right there because we could leapfrog uh, a lot of the uh, of the useless parts of the administration apparatus, ideally, uh, uh, and really structure administration and no normative-wise uh, policies for space that really incentivizes the creation of new space industry in the region, uh, without jeopardizing and respecting, of course, like always, the the European common laws and ethics. And and I think. Uh, uh, if there is a will uh, around the Balkan region for, on a governmental level, this could really lead to a creation of a vibrant and, and really interesting space industry. Uh, and we all know that in the Balkans, we have incredible amount of, uh, especially software engineering groups and, and, and uh, engineering talents in general, huge amount of leading companies from around Europe and around the world have development studios to give a few examples in Bulgaria, at least, uh, we have one of the main development R&D studios of Bosch, of Siemens, uh, SAP Labs, uh, VMware. So, so literally lead, uh, leading and very big companies having their R&D studios here. So I believe that the same engineering uh, talents could easily enter into the space sector and, and be really productive and, 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 and bring positive impact. 
Uh, and I think the role of the government is always only to be an arbiter and to regulate such a streamlined, ideally, regulations and normative basis that, that we can really explore and, and create uh, as fast as possible products and services because at the end of the day, the company does not exist because uh, it's cool to have a company. You, you ideally exist because you bring some added value to, to others through the products or the services that you create. And, and I'm eager to, to, to see in the next few years, actually, I'm a, uh, to be honest, I'm a cautious optimist that we will see positive changes in the in this attitude towards space sector in, in the Balkans. And I expect, expect that a lot of new companies would, uh, would rise from our region, not only from Bulgaria, but also Romania, Greece, uh, Serbia, uh, Bosnia, Croatia, etc. So uh, I, I hope that, that the local politicians and the local economists understand that we right now have an incredible opportunity to create a fundament, uh, a basis on which uh, space economy could really thrive in the next literally few years time, just to open this, uh, this idea that space is there, space is an existing and absolutely important part of the local economy, that space data could impact tremendously in a positive way the lives of millions of people in the Balkans and that the Balkans themselves have the capacity to create added value services and technologies for space for the benefit of, uh, of the region. And I think if, if this happens, uh, uh, hoping that we can play equally important role in, in Europe and on the global market. So I'm an optimist. If, if Endurus that exists today and if I, I've heard here and there for a few other uh, startups rising to the challenge. Uh, why not have a dream about in the next two, three years to have uh, 20 or 50 meaningful companies? And even if just few of them survive and create added value, uh, this is a paradigm change for positive in uh, positive change in, in the region, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And that, those are great words. And uh, since you mentioned the EU, uh, maybe we can uh, have a a petition to have uh, uh, the as the Western Balkans is uh, slowly integrating the, in, into the European Union. Maybe in the future, since those processes are long, maybe we'll also have a, a space development and uh, you know the the importance of space development to actually uh, join the, the European Union. And uh, since and you also mentioned the importance of space data uh, in uh, our everyday lives, but uh, also I would like to mention that. Uh, as they say that uh, space is the best tool to fight climate change and uh, this region is actually facing uh, big consequences of, of climate change now and uh, in the future so uh, that is why we should definitely cooperate on on this uh, on this burning question mm, i would uh, like to interject with a question from igor uh, so uh, he uh, asks, um, what type of space services Endurosat is going to focus in the next five years? And uh, uh, like, uh, for example, a custom satellite manufacturer, CubeSat platform providing uh, launches, organization, uh, satellite data stream maintenance, etc. Yeah, uh, Igor, it's a, it's a fantastic question. Thank you for it. Uh, I wish that I can answer, yeah, we do everything, but Endurosat is a very tiny, uh, small company. And uh, maybe a few words, what we are actually doing uh, as, as a company. Uh, we, de we decided early on that uh, it's the same with the Space Challenges Educational Program. Basically, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that my vision didn't change for the last 11 years. I, I really hope that we could create a better future where everyone has direct access to space sensors and to data from those sensors in, uh, in on the ground. Uh, I envision a future where undoubtedly each one of us would be able to launch and operate uh, smaller or, or more sophisticated sensors in orbit and become a real player and not just an end user of the of these technologies because sadly even with the whole innovation happening right now uh, on planetary level uh, it's still it's quite quite complex and difficult to uh, to to get off the ground your own space mission even if it's a nano satellite so one of the missions when we started Endurosat was uh, how could we change that? Uh, how could we make uh, 
the satellite, the Namstrite as a platform, truly software defined in nature, which means uh, it could handle easily multiple types of sensors. So it's completely agnostic to the sensors and it could co-host many sensors on the same flight. So, so that we can break a few barriers in the process. First, we don't want to see necessarily every time single satellite, single mission or single constellation, single mission. Uh, we want to see single satellite, multiple missions. And, and, and that's why we launched this shared satellite service to the market uh, uh, a few months ago. Um, and everything that Endurosat does on technology or on that specific service level is ideally bringing capacity to innovators in space to, to launch faster and easier their payloads in orbit, their sensors, and to get their data back to the ground at a fraction of the cost. And we try our best to eliminate the entire satellite value chain complexity for our customers. What do I mean by that? Usually to, to launch anything in space, you know very well, you need to assemble the satellite, put the, put the sensor, the payloads, go through a very rigorous space qualification campaigns, and then you came up with a legal nightmare in the process because you have to register frequencies, register launch operations, exports, imports, and everything that takes enormous amount of effort. At the same time, you need to build or rent a ground station. Usually this is very costly long term because uh, and at a certain point in time of your mission doesn't really matter whether you own a ground station or you rent it. This is becoming uh, slowly to change for a better in terms of price, but still it's very expensive and prohibited. Then you need your own mission operations and blah, blah, blah. So all these things is like literally a very complex satellite value chain just to get the data that you want from a sensor that you want to fly in space and usually takes few years. So we decided how, how could we change that? Like how, how, how and could we actually make space accessible for uh, for smaller companies, for, uh, could we give access to the same space infrastructure to everyone without asking them to participate into the entire satellite value chain? Could we eliminate this satellite value chain for them? And this is how we decided, okay, first stop, we need to create our satellites in, a, in, a, in our own way, uh, making them really software driven by design so that the same platform could literally do any type of mission without modifications. So it saves time and money in the process. Secondly, we built our own ground segments, we digitalize our mission control. And, and, and what, what is important is that uh, right now we launch this service and we just tell you, give us what you want to see in space uh, and we take care of the rest. And, and in a few months, you are operating your own sensor in orbit and you're an active player and member of the space community. So this is what we envision as Endorsat. So in the, in the coming few years, we'll be really pushing forward this idea of uh, we imagine a, a world in a time where we have hundreds of different sensors flying on absolute minimum amount of satellites in orbit, streaming on a live basis their data to the ground, and hundreds of entrepreneurs on the ground visualizing this data and, uh, for the benefit of the businesses on the ground. So this is what we ideally want to see. Uh, and uh, hopefully we can have the luck to talk in the next five years and I can share with you how much of this we managed to, to accomplish. And, and, but I'm really ex enthusiastic because I'm pretty sure and I cannot wait to see all the innovations that, uh, that those new generations of entrepreneurs could do in orbit if we give them, if we give them this access and this opportunity to operate and become players in robot orbit. Yeah, uh, so in five years' time, in our Space Cafe Balkan 100th edition, we will talk about uh, what, uh, you know, what have we achieved in those five years? I mean, what have Endurosat achieved? <laughs> and, uh, Not only Endurosat, I really hope that there will be yeah. like hundreds of entrepreneurs. And I give you an example. We are already working with several customers and partners from the Balkans. So in just uh, less than a year from now, we'll see quite a few payloads designed and developed in the Balkans by Balkan engineering companies. And, and I, I, again, I'm pretty sure that this shared satellite service would give opportunity for us to work with insanely more sm smarter and intelligent entrepreneurs from around the globe. Uh, and if we can help them create innovation at the final frontier, what, what better way to do it? And, and hopefully uh, I cannot wait to see the impact that these guys will do in the next uh, few years. And I cannot wait to see thousands of lives uh, in our region and beyond getting impacted because of our customers' sensors are flying in space successfully 
driving innovation via information downlinked by the data in, from space. So that's what we are going to do our best to, uh, we're going to try to our best to achieve and, and hopefully we could take with us on our journey as many of you guys as possible. Yeah, so yeah, talented and also immensely motivated for the greater cause. So um, yeah, uh, since you were talking about the innovations, uh, I would also like to again uh, continue with a question from the audience, uh, Xenia asks, since uh, it is inevitable that space companies will have to consider debris reduction during the manufacturing process, uh, do you have any action plan uh, or ambition to create your product from materials or integrated solutions so they can be self-destroyed or self-pushed out of the orbit? Yeah, that's a great question. It's a great problem and we're really self-conscious about it. I think the whole DNA, the genesis of our service is exactly that. Uh, we want, although we are a satellite builder and an R&D studio, we want to see minimum amount of satellites in space with maximum amount of efficiency. We want ideally those satellites to be shared among all the users, their payloads to, to bring innovation to many people on the ground, direct data access to, to many people on the ground to break finally this barrier between space and non-space. And if we are successful, we'll see minimum amount of satellites in orbit feeding on-demand data on the ground first. And secondly, we are building nanosatellites. Those are literally the uh, one of the smallest possible form factors for any type of spacecraft. We fly in much lower Earth orbits than, uh, than the traditional bigger satellites. Uh, at the end of the mission life cycle, those small tiny boxes, they burn up into the atmosphere. So there is no residual uh, environmental threat to anyone. Uh, we use materials that are, of course, uh, Majority of the materials are absolutely degradable in the in uh, during reentry, so there is no. Uh, I don't believe that it's even possible for a CubeSat to pollute significantly the Earth. If you imagine, it's uh, literally a tiny, tin, a tiny, tiny box. It's like a shoebox. So uh, that's one of the biggest benefits of this service. Not only that we will be sharing space and the resource of the satellite itself as a, as an asset. Uh, but but we'll, be, we'll, we'll be enabling to have hundreds more sensors in space with much less satellites in the process. Uh, and, and this means that automatically this would preserve the orbits for, for the next generations and for the much bigger innovations to come. I, I really am not a big fan of uh, having to send thousands of systems around the globe. It is inevitable, uh, but uh, hopefully we find a way to integrate all this infrastructure and to make it work as a one whole thing, uh, using as an example the internet, because internet is a, is a genius communication network, exactly because different devices are connected via simple protocols. Hopefully we can achieve someday that in space instead of uh, militarizing it and, and building massive uh, single purpose uh, constellations all the time. Yeah, let, let's hope we will be able to avoid the, the massive uh, militarization of space. So uh, you, we have a, another interesting question that I would like to fuse with a question that I will obviously ask uh, right. So, so um, uh, Richard asks, uh, how uh, do we see the opportunity of Serbia in space programs and in private space station programs? And uh, I would like to, uh, as I said, fuse this question with a question for Raicho. So uh, how uh, you talked about the, how the private sector in, uh, in our region can compete by being uh, maybe ta talented and motivated and, and so on. But uh, do you have uh, any, let's say a special advice for uh, how to, for let's say young, younger entrepreneurs in a way that how can the, um, the company from the region compete with already established players? Uh, so, so first, the question about the opportunity of Serbia. I believe Serbia ideally would would have a similar opportunity as the countries in EU, and hope, hoping to see Serbia in EU very, very soon. So, uh, of course, we are fortunate in that Bulgaria is part of the European uh, Economic Zone of European Union, and, and this helps a lot. But in general, I believe that again. We don't have the chance and the option to have multi-billion programs regionally because our, our governments and administrations cannot afford such a big investment right now. But what we can leverage is 
create a, a normative basis, create a simple strategy to, to, to streamline all processes required for you to start a space startup and guide you through, through several of the most painful uh, process of re registrations and organizations. Uh, to start a company, my, my advice is uh, start small. I know it's very difficult when you read in the news, so this company got a hundred million, that company, you, you get very lost, very fast lost into this enthusiastic idea that the current valuation of your company is more meaningful than the value that you can bring through your product and services. And again, at least in my opinion, and this is what drives Endurus at right now is we cannot uh, wait and we are so enthusiastic when we see our customers being success stories of the day and, and we feel part of their success story. And I think this brings us to the next stage and pushes us forward. And I think this mentality should be well defined in, into your mindset if you want to start a space uh, technology company. And the other, th the other thing without a doubt is resilience. I mean, if you imagine that, okay, I worked hard a few months and then everything happens like in the movies, <laughs> I don't think space is a proper environment for you. You should be prepared for many, many challenges uh, all the time. And, and that's good because every challenge that you overcome makes you a bit stronger. But uh, in space is exceptionally disappointing because uh, it really is a long-term bet. It really is an in insanely insane amount of efforts uh, for a long duration of time. So it's like a marathon game. Mm -hmm. And uh, and to all the young entrepreneurs from our region and beyond, uh, I really wish them uh, uh, that to be as resilient as possible and uh, as reflective and self-analyzing uh, as possible while building the building your company and again you're not building a company ideally you're building a value to bring innovation to others and and, and to improve somehow the lives of others and let this be uh, your motivator in the niche area that you would like to professionalize instead of the valuation and, and the money that you're raising uh, in the process that's also a very good life advice in general not only for uh, would-be space entrepreneurs so uh, yeah i think that uh, and it should, an advice that our whole audience should, should definitely have in mind. And um, since uh, I would like to transition to, to the question of education, since you have talked about the uh, chances for entrepreneurs and uh, young space companies in the region, uh, and since you have also uh, finished uh, your education at Space Masters uh, abroad, uh, so what do you think about those uh, education programs in the region and how should the young people, or what should be their decisions? Uh, I mean, uh, should they go abroad maybe, get an education then come back or like be a diaspora and then help the, the our countries from, 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 from abroad? What do you think is the ideal? I mean, obviously there is no ideal solution, but what, what is your view on, on that? Uh, if we have to be honest, uh, space education, as far as I know, again, this is only based on my uh, limited knowledge in the Balkans is very negligible at best. And there is absolutely insignificant investment in education. Nobody almost wants to invest in education because uh, it takes awful lot of time to see it materialize, but nothing is more empowering to create a whole community and to create value than education in general. And I can attest to that because we keep investing and developing uh, our own space challenges program. And for those of you who want to find information online just go to spaceport.academy and, and everything is in english and, and hopefully hoping that the content that we try to create uh, helps you find your way in space i believe to, again technology gives us here incredible in, uh, incredible opportunity because uh, you don't need a massive uh, budget to go online and to study even from the leading universities and schools on the planet to get courses uh, the courses are becoming more and more practice oriented which is amazing I think the, the role of the government here is essential, basically, to, to put forward a strategy for in, in heavy investment in not only space, in, in deep technologies, in, in biotechnology, in, in medicine. Uh, you saw what one uh, small virus did uh, on a global level. Uh, if this doesn't incentivize us that we need more scientists today, we need more engineers, we, we need much more technologies that, than what our current systems uh, are generating in the Balkans. We need them to go out of the university with and schools with relevant education, not with diplomas. This is a big misconception, in my opinion, in the Balkans, where you go 
out of the university with, as, a, as a career, as an engineer. And then you need another one or two years to, just to get off the ground with the fundamentals of the industry actually requires you to have so that you can be of a value to the, uh, to, in the creation of the product or a service. So I think uh, heavy investment in, uh, in education is necessary. Uh, for now in the Balkans, it's wishful thinking, <laughs> but hoping that in the next few years it will change. And again, this is how we try to do it ourselves. Instead of complaining, oh, we don't have space education, we get our own space education program. I'm happy to say and to share and really proud that uh, almost 50% of the people working today at Endurosat came from our own educational program or got linked with Endurosat via our own educational program. So, so if we can do that, and we keep uh, making efforts in this area. I hope that this incentivizes people to really understand that education is a must. Education is, is uh, constant. It's not four years and then you're done and then you go work. And as practice oriented as possible, if you are talking about technology and science, in my opinion, the better because only through practice you improve constantly uh, the skills that you have. So that's, that's uh, my own opinion. Yeah, I would also like to, to say that uh, uh, Endurosat uh, has uh, immensely helped uh, our organization serving case for space uh, in the organization of uh, one uh, regional hackathon that we have done uh, with also some uh, other partners. And uh, that was very important for younger people to actually get in touch with uh, satellite data and uh, simply, you know, thread the waters with, uh, with space technology and uh, I think that's also one of the, uh, let's say, ways to, to simply connect with your, uh, with your, let's say, friends from the university and, and then simply to, to try it out. There are also uh, free uh, space data that you, can, uh, that you can try out and see what you can maybe uh, do with, 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 uh, with the, those types of technology. And then maybe you will uh, get a job in Endurosat. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> uh, let me just have a quick, uh, a quick uh, peek of the Q and A. Uh, I think we already bore, bored the people too much, probably. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, I think this is a very, very important conversation. Uh, yeah, since we have talked about the the talents and young talents. Uh, Sandra asks how difficult it is to find talent to work in space, but you have also already covered it a yeah. bit about their fears and, and all of that, but maybe something has changed recently. Uh, I think we are fortunate in general in Europe to have a treasure trove of talents all around. I wouldn't say the Balkans have better talents than uh, the rest of the European regions. Uh, the question is, how do you funnel this enthusiasm and this talent uh, early on towards an industry or towards the creation of added value in, uh, for the economy? And, and what types of instruments and what types of strategies you have to have from one side on administration, which I don't understand because I'm an entrepreneur and I'm <laughs> never asking an entrepreneur about administration. And, and from the other side, uh, uh, on the entrepreneurial side, what, what is our responsibility as an employer, as, as a founders? Uh, what type of environment we should create so that these talents could really grow and, and create, uh, uh, create incredible and stunning products and services? And, and I have no answer to that question. I mean, the, the simple question, is, the simple answer is yes, we have an uh, amazing amount of talents uh, all around Europe. I don't have a formula, how do you attract them necessarily to work in space or otherwise? And I think it's, it's very personal and it's, it's, uh, it's very specific to the types of entrepreneurs that are going to, to try to attract these talents, but it's doable. If you see in Europe, so many new companies, uh, one example, Lilium also started just a few years ago, right now uh, creating and trying to really redefine the, the future of transportation. Uh, I know personally the founder, unbelievably smart guy right now it's more than seven or 800 young people working there right so they literally created a, an enormous company from scratch uh, Rimac in Croatia in the Balkans creating an incredible innovation in, in electrification of vehicles and, and systems uh, we are very very small to give us an example but again we are almost 100 people creating small space uh, eco system in, in the region so it's doable and no one has a one single formula how to do it, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 
I would also like to mention that uh, since we're on the topic of education, we have another partner. So Space Force Global and Thorsten said that they will be happy to support Enduro Sat Education Program. <laughs> so that's great. Yeah, that will be fantastic. And sincerely, thank you for, for that proposition. And I'm definitely going to take notice of it and connect you after the call and, and, and talk to you guys. So from my side, I really appreciate the, the, uh, the invitation. Uh, I really feel fortunate and humbled to participate. Uh, many, many thanks for Space Watch Global for organizing those cafes. I'm watching them and learning a huge amount for, from different regions. And I'm really looking forward to our next meeting and hopefully we can brag about uh, new innovations. In a few weeks, we are flying our first shared satellite service mission. So hopefully in the next few months, we can share much more even data and, and information about the real effect and the tangible uh, impact of those missions on, uh, uh, in the space industry. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah, yeah, those are, we will all be uh, glued to our monitors and, and check those, those news as soon as they come out. Uh, thank you, Raitro. And uh, again, I would like to thanks to, a big thanks to Space Forge Global for the help in organization of this web talk. And uh, yeah, thank you to the audience for having great questions. And uh, this was really, really nice, uh, uh, fun flowing uh, conversation. Uh, so yeah, for the end, uh, Chiara, I guess back to you. Thank you very much, Marco. And thank you to both Marco and Raicho for such an amazing talk and uh, very cool insights to the line of work. So um, yes, it was, these are exciting times. So before uh, all of you leave, I'd like to just mention our next upcoming Space Cafe events. So tomorrow at 4 p.m., we launch our very first Space Cafe Spain by Isan Paris, which will be in Spanish. And then next week, on the 1st of June, uh, Torsten will have his Space Cafe 33 Minutes with Professor Thomas Schirknecht about astronomy and sustainability. Two days later, on the 3rd of June, at 10 a.m., we will have our Space Cafe Australia by Annie Handmere, and she will be talking to uh, Dr. Tim Parsons. And then a day later, on the 4th of June at 4 p.m., we have our next Space Cafe Russia edition um, by Elina Morozova, and she will be talking to Dr. Viktor Stirilitz, and this will be in Russian, of course. The week after that, we will also have uh, 33 minutes with Dr. Cassandra Steer, the next edition of Space Cafe Moriba Vox Populi, and our next Space Cafe Benelux edition with me. So stay tuned on that. All our events are going to be online on Eventbrite. As always, we would really like to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And don't forget to sign up to our daily or bi-week newsletters at Spacewatch Global. And if you'd like to treat yourselves to something special, become a Space Watcher today. Your support will help us greatly. So just take out your credit card and visit our fan shop at shop.spacewatch.global. I know that we say this often, but we do need your support to continue our work and we really enjoy doing so. So thank you to all of you very much for your interest today. And thank you especially also to Raicho and Marco for such an inspiring talk and for being our guests. And thank you so much to the team behind the scenes for doing a great job week by week again. I hope you will all stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you for joining us. Uh, hope to see many of you back next week. And in the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher.